Welcome to the Jean Hales Podcast Women's Health Week series, where we talk about all the things you want to hear but can never ask. Here's your host, Janet Mishelmore. Today we're going to be talking about mental health with one of the most esteemed leaders in the field, Professor Jane Fisher. Jane has a CV longer than my arm, but she is currently serving as Professor of Global Health and Director of Global and Women's Health at Monash University. I'd really love people to find a quiet place to listen to this conversation as we talk about the sadness and the confusion that we're all experiencing right now. I found her words both moving and helpful, and I hope you will too. Here's my interview with Professor Jane Fisher. Jane, I've got a confession to make. I have never cried more in my life than I have in the last 18 months. Can you tell me what it is about COVID that has unnerved us? Look, it's such a good question and one we all really have to think about. The first thing I think is that your observation is absolutely right, that everyone is feeling altered and everyone is feeling, I think, more anxious and uncertain, perhaps a bit more fragile, finding it more difficult to feel that they know how to manage things that in normal life would be quite manageable. And of course, there are people within the community who are experiencing it at a much more severe level than the average change that that we're experiencing that you and I are both recognising in what you've described. Your word fragile is fantastic because things that didn't tip me over have suddenly started tipping me over. Can you explain to me what it is that I'm missing maybe in my life or everybody is missing? What is it that this change has done? Look, uh, I think there are probably uh, multiple contributing factors. I think what it's revealing to us is that our well-being, our equilibrium is maintained by things we might not notice on a day-to-day basis but it's maintained by having access to interactions with other people, our colleagues, our friends, our family members, that are easy, that don't require intense planning, and that are actually in person. They're not by a digital link. The other thing is it's really interfered with our capacity to do our purposeful activity. So whether that's voluntary work or involvement with a community group, or professional work, none of that can happen in the way that we're accustomed to. And I think what this is showing us is those things are essential to maintaining our equilibrium. And when they're taken away, we really notice that gap. Jane, one of the things I've heard you talk about is this has been a period of missed opportunities. I'm very conscious of that. And I think we have lost many experiences that constitute what gets called technically disenfranchised losses. What does that mean? (laughs) It, it, It is, I think, a helpful construct. What it means is that these are losses, lost opportunities or lost experiences that are not publicly recognised and for which there's no ceremony or um, acknowledgement. So plenty of people have experienced bereavement during COVID, and that's had very particular poignancy, and we might come back and talk about that. But there have been multiple losses that people have experienced for which there is no recognition. Nobody brings a casserole because your daughter's wedding was called off. That is such a great point. It's fabulous. You you weren't able to have the big celebratory birthday you'd been planning. Your graduation ceremony was postponed. But these are really important life experiences. Some of them might be recaptured at some point in the future, but many are actually gone forever. And so you have to adjust to the fact that this experience you anticipated with such pleasure and being so important it has been taken from you. And of course, for young people, they have anticipated embarking on post-secondary education and learning opportunities or a first job or moving out of home. And all of these important milestones have been really disrupted 
or actually taken away. And we know that these are a source of sadness and regret and then ultimately the challenge of, well, how do I adjust to that? This is not how I wanted it to be, but this is how it is. And I think for me, one of the problems is the feeling of, am I being a spoiled brat to feel sad about this? Or actually, is it okay to feel sad? Look, I think it's absolutely okay to feel sad. The hard bit is the sadness is sometimes a bit formless. You're not absolutely sure what you're sad about. And that's why I find disenfranchised grief quite helpful to think I'm actually grieving that I will never witness that thing that I thought I was going to experience or that I will not see that elderly relative who lives interstate who's frail and sick. Those are real losses, even though they're not publicly recognised losses. And it is right to feel grief. What we have to hold on to is that grief is a process, not an end point. So we need to feel the sadness and then we need to begin to adjust and think, well, what is it I can do in this situation, even when what I wanted to do is withheld from me? And that's how we begin, I think, to solve problems to advance. Jane, you've just said something that I think is really important about resolving grief. In a more formal process, a relative has died, a parent has died, a friend has died, there is a much more structured process. How do people motivate themselves to actually start that process? It is much more difficult, I think. And the first step is recognising it, is recognising that I am feeling sad because of whatever it was. And then I think there is a really important process of saying, well, what can I do intentionally and actively to mark this as a turning point? I think constructing ceremonies or rituals is something that people might feel awkward about, not feel that this is something that they're comfortable with. But there are equivalent things that can be done. So there are ways of noting it privately. Some people like to plant something in the garden or make something beautiful or prepare a special meal, noting publicly this is to acknowledge what might have been and is not going to be and to give us a starting point, a turning point for thinking how do we plan what the future might be like without that in it. Some people are really good with uncertainty. I'm not. How do people cope with a very uncertain world? Look, it's such a good question. And I'm convinced this is probably one of the main things contributing to the sense of being a bit dispirited, a bit demoralised, that we can experience ourselves and see around us. Uncertainty is especially difficult because it gives us a sense we have no agency over our day-to-day lives. We know that agency is one of the things that gives us a sense of uh, being able to be decisive, being able to be active. The difficulty with lacking agency is I think we feel very much at the mercy of processes that are outside us. At some level, people can come to feel a bit suspicious, almost paranoid about that. So the main thing we can do with uncertainty is change the way we think. So we often can't change the events. The one thing we have some charge over is how we think. So I think it involves that really active process of saying this is difficult, but it is not a disaster, and trying to wind down the anxiety that comes with thinking that an experience is catastrophic or disastrous. So it really is having to practice bringing those catastrophizing thoughts, the going over and over, the ruminating over something, into check by reframing them. I'm laughing, Jane, because this is me going over and over and maybe thinking the worst will happen. Have you got a line or something that you would suggest to people who are listening to this that they could use to stop that process? Because while you and I are talking, it seems so easy. 
but actually it's not. It's not. So the first thing is to recognise anxiety is usually something we are conscious of when we feel it physically. So we know that we can feel a bit sick or we feel tension or we're really conscious that our heart is racing. But what has preceded that is actually the thoughts. So the first step is to try and recognise, well, what is it that I'm thinking? And then as we begin to focus on that and realise that we are allowing ourselves to think in a disaster frame of mind, thinking this is going to go on forever, the whole of my future is going to be tainted, I will never be able to do what it is I wanted to do. Using those kinds of statements is actually unhelpful. So once you recognise that, the next step is to say, and how can we recast that? And the recasting is being able to say very frequently to ourselves, this is a difficult situation, not a disaster. This is a temporary situation, not permanent. This is something that will affect my life at the moment, but it won't affect it forever. So trying to turn it into a more realistic, perhaps, and more manageable way of thinking about a situation. Jane, can I ask you a question about, we've talked about managing anxiety amongst us all as adults, even young adults, older adults. What I'd love to know is your advice on how parents manage anxiety in children. What are two strategies that parents who are listening to this could use? This is such an important thing because for a child, their parents are their world. For adults, we have many potential ways in which we can interact with the wider world. But for a child, especially a young child, their parents are their world. I think this is one where parents can set an example of how you adapt to life difficulties. And this is especially hard because it's long. It's not just a short event, it's a long event where they can remind children that this is difficult but it's not forever and there are things that we can do together that will give us enjoyment every day. So the parents who seem to be enabling their children to flourish are those who have intentionally done something every day that gives them pleasure in their interactions as a family, whether it's making something or cooking something or laughing about something. And that, I think, is something that that will really strengthen children's capacity to live through this and live through and flourish, not live through and be depleted and diminished by it. Jane, if I had to wrap up and say, are there three things that you would recommend to us all to improve our mental health, what would those three things be? Well, the first one would be become familiar with your own patterns of thinking. Identify those that are unhelpful and try to counter them. So try to reframe them so that you can think about life and your own life in a way that is more optimistic. The second one, I think, is intentional kindness, to really intentionally allow to come out of your mouth, even when you feel irritated or short-tempered, things that are kind, courteous and encouraging to others. And the last thing, I think, is to reflect on what it is that you will take with you from this experience that you didn't know about yourself before. So you will take with you into the future a sense that I managed this, I survived this, I grew through this, and that is something that will benefit you into the future. So those are the three things I would take with me. Jane, as always when I speak to you, I have lots of other questions to ask you, but you have just nailed it with your second take-home message, and that's all about kindness. Thank you very much for a wonderful overview. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I'm so pleased to have the conversation. This conversation with Jane really hit home. What we're going through is grief, and it's really important for our recovery to acknowledge it. 
at Jean Hale's mental health is our number one concern right now. So we will be following up with Jane over the next month. Please do stay tuned for more episodes and thank you for listening. You've been listening to the Jean Hales podcast, Women's Health Week series. Today's episode has been brought to you by Lipitemba. For free, expert health information for all women, girls and gender diverse people, visit jeanhales.org.au.